Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Passionately Wrong Podcast. This is James Beller Show. I'm here together with Randy Searles, and we're going to spend a few minutes today talking with you about physical fitness habits. Now, this is something you can hear a lot about in a lot of different places. It's because it's important to people how they feel and how they look, I suppose. Your health is one of the few things that is partly within your control, but also partly entirely outside of your control. The things that happen to you will have a big impact on the quality of your life. So today, I guess we want to do two things. We haven't talked about this beforehand, so I might surprise Randy, but we're going to talk about what are some things that you should do to improve your chances of staying physically fit. And we'll add to that, what are some things you should not do to avoid being passionately wrong about pursuing your fitness. I have to start by making a confession, which is to say that I have, for a long time, up until my mid-30s, was not really fit at all, didn't focus on it, didn't pay attention to it, and as a result of my sedentary lifestyle and desk job, got relatively overweight and out of shape. And it was only in the last 20 years that I really paid attention to it, so I'm certainly happy to tell you what I did and what I do now, but I might need to start by saying I'm probably not the poster child for having had a long life of paying attention to fitness. I think that might be different for you. In a way, in my in my 20s and up, maybe it's different. But in high school, I sought after the, le- we talked about this in a previous episode, kind of what we did in college and how you got your shot put discus varsity <laughs> letter And I got into cross country, which is not the most jockey sport because of our friend, Tom, our friend, Tom was doing it. And so I just wanted to hang out with Tom. So I ended up doing it. And then, and then I also rolled in. I always loved swimming. So I did, I ended up in the last two years of two or two years of high school doing track, cross country and swimming all very poorly. But I think one of the things we're, we should talk about is just showing up, right? I didn't do it to get in shape. I did it because my friends were doing it. And so I never really constant. But I had this amazing friend. His name was Andrew. And he would he had such laser focus, even in high school. He ended up going to MIT, and he ended up getting fantastic grades, and especially in all science. And he ended up have, starting his own business and things like that later on. But even in fitness, he had his, I'm going to be great at pull-ups. And he he didn't have a pull-up bar. We didn't have these kind of things back then when in the 80s and 90s. They existed, obviously, but you didn't have these internal pull-up bars that you put on your door or stop or something like that. But he had some stairwells where not very not very a well grip, but he would figure out how to grip and he would do so many pull-ups every day or every morning, every afternoon. And then and he it would increase his grip so they could grip it better. And by the end of the year, he was doing like 30 pull-ups, 40 pull-ups, which most people can never say they ever did in their life. And this is in high school. He had just this laser focus that he would say, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to be able to lift myself off the ground in a L-shaped position with just my hands and hold myself. Imagine the core strength that takes. And he was not, and he didn't do any sports in high school. He just said, this is what I want to do. And he would, it wasn't even Google back then. So I don't even know how he researched it, but he just like mechanically, he was mechanically inclined. He would say, okay, I got to be able to do my grip. I got to be able to bend my wrist so much. And so these are, there's, I think one part of this podcast that we're, this uh, we're talking about here is focus, consistency, showing up. Even if you never, if you're never able to do 40 pull-ups in a row or lift yourself up with your core strength, so my experience was I wasn't very, I wasn't super fit. I wasn't bad. I was never in the top 10 or maybe the top five. I guess there was only like eight of us anyway. It's a small school, in any of my sports, but they all accidentally benefited me in the military. And then of course, in the military, I went into special operations where fitness is preferred. In fact, there's so many challenges and tests to get into the Rangers and the Green Berets that you have to be fit. And then I remembered, Andrew, when I was going through this stuff and preparing for these elite things, 
And I used to go, okay, what's the worst possible thing they can throw at me in the Green Beret course? And then I would prepare for it. And I would climb ropes like in the morning, the afternoon, the night, because ropes are a big obstacle that people fail in obstacle courses. I don't know if anyone, if you knew that or not, but climbing a rope is, there's always five or six different kind of rope obstacles. And so I got to where I could climb a rope with just my arms with equipment on. And I said, okay, I think I'll, I think whatever they're going to throw at me, I think I can do it through ropes. And then I said, I know I'm going to have to march with a ruck. And I would, all right. So if I can work up to marching 50 miles straight with a ruck at a specific speed with this much weight, I don't think there's time enough in the Green Beret challenge to do anything worse than that is what I mean, I'm just logically looking at this. I'm breaking it down. And I did very well in all my 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 things that I qualified for. And I tell everyone, when everyone asks me, hey, I want to do this, how do you how do I prepare for this? I said, imagine the worst possible thing they could throw at you and exceed it before you get there. But that's that that's less about your my physical fitness habits now at this age. And later on, after I hurt myself in special operations and had to recover, I do I have a lot different attitude towards it than I did. Yeah. So far for me, the story of your friend Andrew and the story of you preparing for the special forces qualification is a testament to showing up the power of focus and also that you can, most people can do way more than they think if they put a significant amount of effort into it. And the reason people shy away is because that effort is hard and it's frankly not necessary for most things either. The sport that I got into when I started doing regular activity was running and it didn't take me long to work my way up the well of running one kilometer is good, running five is better, and then running 10, then running half marathons and running marathons. And then eventually why don't you do an Ironman or an ultra? And the type of personality that makes you succeed at an activity when you need to devote a lot of effort to it is also the kind of focus and persistence that can create unproductive activity, unproductive habits. So I know people who've obviously gone far too far and run themselves almost literally into the ground with not being able to back off when they have an injury, for example, and they need to take time off. And maybe this is something that everybody has to go through. You try something out, oh, if I work really hard at this, I can get better. And then you devote even more time to it. And it becomes your focus. And you're like, I'm going to ride my bike everywhere all the time. And you ride 300 mile weeks. And then you got to overdo it before you realize, oh, I don't need to do it that much for it to have a benefit to me. So I'm going to back off. So there's a little bit of youthful exuberance that then needs to get tempered by painful experience that then needs to get tempered by age and experience. If I look at so many people that I know who've gone through different cycles of exercise and fitness and habits, I'm not going to say don't do it. I'm not going to say don't get intensely focused on something and then really push yourself to excel because actually it's kind of cool to see what you can do, isn't it? And it, it gives you lessons about perseverance and about hard work and about pushing through difficulty and pain that I found served me well in totally mundane, non-sports, non-physical activities. If I was worried about going to the dentist, I'd say, ah, come on, you big baby, you can run a marathon. What are you worried about sitting half an hour in a dentist chair or being afraid about getting up in front of a class teaching or going into a tough negotiation? I'd say, ah, come on, you can run for six hours. What are you worried about standing in front of a class with a suit on? So the mental fortitude that I built in my admittedly non-threatening and much simpler, I'm guessing, activities than anything you did still benefited me a lot. So my point with that is to say, it's easy to find yourself in an extreme of either being completely sedentary and doing nothing or getting the fitness bug and going all the way over to an, a side that runs the risk of you creating an overuse injury or something like that. But I see the merits in allowing yourself to go through the journey because it's only through having completed the journey and had some highs and lows that you can then take the lessons from them. Does that, any of that make sense to you? Yeah, it all makes sense, James. I would say that, I don't know if you ever heard of the hard 75. No, it's this a new challenge. It's a challenge. It's, I think it's actually called the hard 75 challenge or the 75 hard challenge. So you can look it up, but basically it's very simple and very vague on purpose so that people can stick with it. 
and the, the challenge is for 75 days, no, no cheat days, no, no breaks. You do two workouts, two 45 minute workouts. And one of them has got to be outside. And it can be as simple as walking 45 minutes, or you go to the gym for 45 minutes and walk for 45 minutes or two walks for 45 minutes. But it's basically two intense in, intentioned workouts. And one of them has got to be outside. It's drink. I believe it's drink four liters of water a day. Um, stick to a diet. And it doesn't say what diet. You choose the diet that resonates with you and you stick with it for 75 days. And then it also tries to focus on developing your mind as well. So you read something at least for a half an hour a day because people are getting away from reading and audiobooks don't count. It's read. You read read for 30 minutes a day. And, and I think that was it. There might have been I something think else. I think but... this podcast counts though. <laughs> Maybe. But anyway, I think these are, we've talked about this before, showing up and not beating yourself for not showing up. Oh, you don't get the 75 days, but you don't quit or put it off for another month and then start again because you're frustrated with yourself. Get back on the horse and you do it again. And maybe over the 75, you only get 65. And then maybe you do the 75 days again and you get one extra day the next time. But I think showing up and realizing that life gets in the way. It wasn't until I turned 50, the year I got out of the army, that I had three or four months as I was getting transitioning where I had time to make my own schedule and go to the gym for twice a day for an hour and a half each time and watch my diet. And that I finally, for the first time in my life, saw abs. And really? I've done, yeah, and I've worked and I've done Green Beret, Ranger training, working out five hours a day, but eating like crap because they, because if you're in the training, they're just going to give you MREs, which are just really calorie high. And I've run marathons and I've done the, I've done the Spartan races and stuff like that. Never had the best I ever did was one ab and, and never came in close, but when I turned 50, for those four months, it was after I walked the Camino, which was a 500-mile walk across Spain for a month, and I lost, I lost 10 or 20 pounds doing that. And then for th almost three months straight, I worked out every day, swim and work out with weights and for every day for about two to two and a half hours a day while I was transitioning out of the military and doing all the paperwork and things. And like at the end of that, I still have the picture. I'm like, this is the dream at 55. I just turned 55. I was like, this is the dream. I got to get back to this. If I did it at 50, I can do it at 55. But I, I don't spend the time I did back then by any means. But I also think that you were talking about over overdoing it. I think that fitness can be as addictive as playing computer games. People want to spend six hours doing this. But and they start running and doing triathletes in order to prepare. I have never prepared for an Ironman, but I would assume if you're preparing for Ironman, it's three or four hours of your life a day. You have to run and swim and bike and you have to fit all that in and you have to do longer distances. So it just takes more time. And if you if you dedicate your life to doing that kind of thing all the time, that's what is going to take up all your free time. I imagine. I don't know. Have you done an Ironman kind of thing? I haven't done an Ironman. I did triathlons for a little bit to get a bit of variation from running. And I worked my way up to the half Ironman distance. And I'm struggling with giving up the dream of doing an Ironman. So <laughs> I've, I have good friends who do them and compete at a high level. And the training commitment is intense. You can, I suspect, from what I've read, get away with maybe two hours a day on average over the course of a week, but it's a serious time commitment. You're right. And if you want to do it well, you put in even more time. The 75 day challenge or the hard 75 challenge, what I like about it and what it demonstrates for me is, and this is a general phenomenon in life, you can do a lot if you don't give yourself an easy excuse, an easy out. And doing something every day for any number of days, and 75 days is actually a good amount, two and a half months, that, that requires you to deal with many opportunities to just quit and give up, right? Because it'll there'll be days where it's cold out, where it's rainy out, where it's hot out, 
where you really genuinely have other things that you need to get done. But if you can stick with the challenge, you realize, oh, these are all just priorities and I can choose how to prioritize my time and choose to do it. If you really want to get out and walk 45 minutes a day, twice a day, or go to the gym once and walk once and drink my water, whatever the elements of the challenge are, you absolutely can do it. I did a running streak once just for fun, right? I've done it a couple of times for 10 months. I said, okay, I'm going to run at least five kilometers a day. I ended up being shorter than I originally wanted. I wanted to run five kilometers a day for 555 days, just because I like the round number. <laughs> I just started and I was like, all right. And I did my regular marathons and marathon training in between. So on many days I was running longer, but I was like, no matter what, no matter how tired I am, no matter what the weather's doing, no matter how busy I am at work, working then, I'm just going to do it. And it becomes satisfying to be able to keep the streak going. Of course, there are days where you would prefer not to, but you tell yourself that's just your mind talking. It's just an excuse. And there are priorities that you are choosing all the time, whether you realize it or not. When you sit down on the couch and eat a bag of potato chips versus get out the door for a walk with your dog, that's just making a choice. I realized over time that the key to success with most things, and certainly with physical fitness, is consistency. You are, and this is something where the people who want to go both feet in and get really intense about it, they need to watch out because it'll actually set your health back if you work really hard and you do a thousand push ups on one day and then you make yourself so sore that you don't work out again for a week and then you're at least four runners, and I don't know how this is for other sports, that by far the biggest predictor of whether a person will be successful in a race or progress in their fitness is whether they are able to train consistently. So there's something to be said for a challenge. I would say pick one that is a level of difficulty that on any given day or period of days, you can actually comfortably do it. And then the challenge becomes more mental than a physical one. You don't want to pick such a difficult physical challenge that you really are at difficulty of not finishing it because I think the benefits are actually mental more than anything else of showing yeah I can do this I can absolutely do something hard and maintain the effort yeah I agree with all that I think and you touched on this before and I didn't do much of this when I was younger the flexibility thing yoga I've been doing I've been I know I need to do more of that as I get older and I haven't done as much I, during that time when I got to my six pack ish it was close I was doing yoga too. So I was I was really spending a lot of time on my health. I was also getting athletic massages because I was so sore after all this stuff. And it, it ended up being like, like I was listening to the Gwyneth Paltrow yeah. court case and someone interviewed her and asked what her normal day was. And I was like, and I listened to it. I was like, only someone like her could afford that day. I, I, I go for an hour walk. I do, I do an hour of Pilates. I go do sauna for an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon. And it's just like, who can do that? If you have a real job, who could do that? The so, eight hours of self-care, what do I do with the rest of the day? Actually, I, I actually pay for a trainer here. And fortunately, where I live, it's relatively a lot cheaper than it would be in the States. It's 20 hours, $20 for an hour which is obviously a lot less than what, it, what you can do in the U.S. And I'm very fortunate there. But I do it because I know I, I'll go to the gym. I'll show up to the gym and I'll just start working out without even stretching and not even warm up. I'm just like, OK, 210. And, I'll, and I know eventually I'll hurt myself. I mean, I hurt myself that day, but I will someday. And I know better. But I also know I'm also on the clock. I'm like, I got an hour to do this and this. And if I screw around and stretch, then I won't get it in and, and I won't do the thing. And, I, and mentally, I know that's wrong, but I'm also on my time. But I actually show up four times a week with this, uh, with this trainer and she forces me, like she says, all right, today we're going to do an hour stretching and doing mobility for your shoulders because you have shoulder problems. And I'm like, oh, okay, I thought we were going to do, nope, that's what we're going to do. And she forces this into my, and I've told her to do this and she does, and I do whatever she says. So I do that. And then I have also a leg slash knee stretch and mobility things. I have bad knees and it's really good because she forces this on me at least once a week, we have a mobility day, an hour instead of a workout. And it's great. And the thing is, I don't depend on her for all my workouts. I'll go to the gym and do something for a half an hour in the afternoon as well. So it, it works out for me. 
but I think the mobility and flexibility, you know, I think, yo I think yoga is great. I suck at it. I tried it. I did it for three months and I was like the, they could have made a movie with me starring in it because I'm the retarded yoga guy that is always trying to up for up in the position for five seconds and collapses with a lot of noise and sweat. And everyone else is like, Jesus, why is this guy interrupting our yin yang? And, but so you're getting at two things that I think we should make sure we elaborate. One is, what is the point of this exercise? Why do you do it, right? You want to look good with your six pack? Do you want to feel good? Are you trying to extend your longevity? It can be any of those things, right? And I understand people's motivations will differ. I would say I benefited from regular exercise once I started doing exercise in a number of regards. I felt like it served as a way to deal with stress at work. So it's just a change of pace. I always felt better after coming back from a run. It allowed me to think better. Sometimes I would get ideas while I was running. I liked the sense of having boundless energy. I would still do run up the stairs two or three at a time. I just like feeling like I can navigate my physical environment well. So there's a, gen a sense of physical general well-being and mental well-being that comes when you regularly use your body. Your body actually is an amazing machine. And if you work it well, it, I find that you generally feel good. Looking good and just looking fit and being able to wear normal clothes is a side benefit, but it's a nice thing as well. So I would say for people who are wondering, why should I, you guys are crazy. I'm not doing any of the stuff that you've done or do. Why should I care about being fit? You have to answer that question for yourself, but there are benefits of just feeling good as the day goes on. I admit, I also have in the back of my mind, the idea that physical fitness is a contributor to longevity and not only to longevity. So, you know, living long, but living a healthy life so that you can get around on your own and you can be independent and the quality of your life as you age is one of the things that is most heavily impacted by your level of physical fitness. If you hope to live a long life, imagine what your quality of life is going to be as you age. And that's a motivator for me, at least, to pay attention to fitness. And then the last thing I wanted to mention that I wanted to get your thoughts on a little bit more, you've already given us one hint, is I've been paying attention to physical fitness and how to basically be healthy for decades. And I usually can come pretty quickly to after let's say three, six months of dedicated research, okay, this is how the field works. And I understand the basic principles for a lot of topics, even complex legal topics, right? For physical fitness, I am continually amazed at how contradictory and awful the information is. You'll get every kind of advice, just really every kind of advice and most of it conflicting about what to eat, how to exercise, what's the best thing to do. Even here on the, our podcast today, Randy, I don't think we've been clear about, is there any, <laughs> that's just not our fault necessarily. It's just, I don't believe that there's good information. Even if you get expert help, like you've got a physical therapist that you go to, and I'm sure she's pretty good at the specific things. Here's how we make sure that your shoulder stays flexible. And I think that is one part answer to the question. Make sure you talk to people who are experts but I got to tell you, I've talked to running coaches and people who are supposed experts in just one little area, and they'll give you conflicting advice and lots of it. So maybe my general question, I'd like to see if you have any thoughts on this, is how do you get good advice about, and we've talked about this before in the area of how do you pick good tools to support you in your writing? And we said, you maybe don't obsess over it. You just pick one that works for you and then don't worry about optimizing it to the nth degree. Maybe that is the answer. Don't worry about optimizing it so much, but it does bother me that I don't believe humanity has clear answers on health and nutrition and exercise more than be active and don't overeat. Really? That's the best you can do? <laughs> Though that's probably a start, no matter what. Yes, it is a start. Uh, I don't know if we want to get too far into eating. That might be a different podcast because there's so many pieces of that puzzle that are confusing, okay, conflicting. One, and but it's a good let's, Yeah. But uh, where I get my, I hate to say it, but I do get some of my stuff from social media, but I don't take it at its face value. I always, I, as soon as I see something that looks interesting, that I hadn't thought of, that I have never tried that maybe will fix the problem I have or make my make me a better, better fit wise, I research it. 
just like you said. And I do, and I try to get, I try to get, and I also try to look at who these people are, what they're, it's also hard to tell sometimes because people can just put whatever they want on social media. Yeah, I'm a master's in physiokinetic ninja ship and I'm a whatever, whatever. <laughs> How do you know? I'm a, I'm an editor. No one's asked, ever asked me for my credentials. I have an MFA in creative writing. I have a bunch of cert- certificates and editing and courses that I've went through, but not one person has ever said, what, what makes you qualified to look at my manuscript and charge me a bunch of money and make it better? It's weird. And I'm, I feel like that's kind of social media too. You can say you're a doctor of whatever, but how am I ever, are you going to show me your, unless you're on TV and you're a super famous personality, no one's going to, where's your birth certificate, president, whatever, no one's going to care. So I try to balance that with, I also try not to do something too extreme without a lot of research and maybe a professional walk me through it initially. And you had written in the notes for this episode about walking backwards. And I don't know if you've talked about it at all, if you've ever looked into walking backwards. So I've stumbled on this uh, Instagram re- reel and, and in- yeah, in- Instagram page of a guy who who has written some books on it. And he does a lot of YouTube videos and stuff. It's called Knees Over Toes. And it's his, everyone has a story, right? Stories are powerful. His story is he got hurt as he was trying to get, become a, get out of high school and get a basketball scholarship. He got hurt and he had to, he tried to go through the rehabilitation process, but he found it very frustrating. And he did a lot of research and he, and he developed his own plan and it involves walking backwards. It involves pushing the sleds and pulling the sleds and involves reverse calf raises and things like that, that when he explains them in a scientific anatomy physiology way, based on my medical background, it makes sense. And so I have started doing them to my detriment, I might ask, I might add, because I we have a mall here where I live. And in the States, if the mall doors open, you can go in and walk around. And in fact, people have made it a thing where that's where they walk. If it's raining or snowing, they'll walk in the mall, right? And the mall encourages it because you window shop. So you walk around the mall and you do your miles or your steps and stuff. This is a thing in the U.S., right? Am I wrong? Yeah. I feel like mall it walking. is. Yeah, yeah, they got holes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, yeah, yeah. Shoes so, and so I go to the mall on the way to my trainer and my trainer doesn't open till seven. But I get there, I get to the mall at six. I have to pass through the mall. I don't have to go through the mall. I can go around the mall to get to my trainer, but I said, Hey, I'm in the mall. I'll walk backwards because there's really, why isn't anyone walking in the mall? The mall's open, but it's cold outside. So I'm going to walk backwards. So I'm like an idiot. People are, I'm sure, but there's no one to stare at me except for the security guards. So I'm walking, I'm like, I'm walking backwards in the mall on the second level. And and the security guards, they're talking down there and they see me and they're like, they start talking to me in Romanian. I'm like, Hey, they're like, get down here. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, get out of here. And I was like, what? And so I just thought it was weird. The mall was, the door was open, but it was open for the workers oh, to get in there. To get to their yeah. Stores. The employees to get their storage. <laughs> so I get kicked out. And then as I walk out the other side, I walked in kind of a more obvious entrance to where there's a big street, there's a Starbucks there. And so I, that's where all the workers walk in. There's a Another entrance that comes in through like the parking lot, but it also goes out to a lake and all the homeless people are like, let us in, it's cold. And the security guard's like, oh, when the mall's open, you can wander in here, but stay out. And I'm walking out like, why don't you just walk around the mall? (laughs) And then I told my wife and she's like, don't ever do that again. People know me and now they know you and you'll embarrass me because you're an idiot for walking backwards in the mall. That's just dumb. And I'm like, what? It's good for my fitness. (laughs) Besides how easy it is to make missteps, again, not to make a pun, (laughs) something similar happened to me one time when I traveled to China and I went shopping late at night when I first got there. I'll tell you next time. But I think we also ought to devote some time on a future episode to how to do your own research and assess the credibility if you're looking into a topic. I haven't read a lot about 
or watched anything about walking backwards? And how would a person listening to us decide, was that a good thing to do or not, if I want to add that to my fitness regime? That's not a trivial problem. It's one that I admit is so tricky that I'm secretly hoping the next generation of AI cuts through all the nonsense for us and says, look, <laughs> I researched 500 papers and watched a million YouTube videos so I can tell you this is the answer about what you should be doing. Wouldn't that be nice? For the moment, we're still left to our own devices to figure this stuff out. If I had to say there are some basic principles that I do believe apply to the physical fitness topic, it would probably be consistency and regular activity. It doesn't matter what you do, whether you play basketball, whether you ride a scooter, whether you go walk. And I really genuinely believe it does not matter unless you want to become expert in something, which is different. We're just talking about physical fitness. If you want to maintain a level of physical fitness, stay active. If you can do half an hour a day, great. If you could do an hour a day, probably better, but do something most days. And that all by itself will put you in a very good position. And then if you can also pay attention to your diet, and that's going to also be the topic of a future episode. Anything we'd like to add to that as things that you can say very likely are important and will contribute to a person's physical fitness? No, I agree with everything you just said. I would say show up. If 75 hard is too hard, then make your own 75 hard. Maybe it's five days a week and you do two, you walk for, for half an hour and you do some weights for half an hour and you stretch for half an hour. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's all you can afford because you don't have the time, but mm -hmm. make your own 75 hard, show up and do the best you can and don't hit, don't beat yourself up about it. If you miss a day or life gets in the way and just that's all we can ask in life, right? Do the best you can. I like that. And that actually is a really important point. If you've made it a habit and something gets in the way of a day, don't let that set you back more than just that day and say, all right, tomorrow I'm going to keep on going. And we shall as well, Randy. So for the moment, we'll say <laughs> thanks for listening, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Talk to you guys later. We'd love to hear what you think. So please comment on the show with your thoughts. We read all of your comments. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for subscribing. See you next time.